good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world. This is Tim Collins, Secretary General of World Stainless, and welcome to the second session today in our webinar series, this time entitled Stainless Steel Reinforcement. Uh, now, there's a few messages before we get into the uh, webinar proper. And uh, firstly, uh, we'd like people that want to ask any questions that will be dealt with at the end of the, the webinar to please pitch them in the chat function and that way we can combine the same or similar questions uh, and be more efficient with our Q&A process. Equally, uh, any questions we don't actually get time to answer during the webinar will receive an answer by email. So uh, just be mindful of that, please. Also, all attendees will get a copy of this presentation, so there's no need to put that in the Q&A request. Uh, that is naturally part of our process. And then one sort of final piece of information. Um, the whole issue of sort of reinforcement of, of concrete and corrosion is very complex, and there are many, many different possibilities and scenarios here. This webinar cannot expect to deal with everything so this is solid guidance but please remember that scenarios are, are different and if this is an area you're working in the guidance will sort of indicate the sorts of things you need to focus on and we have live examples so there's some genuine examples here but remember it can't cover every single possibility of environment circumstances etc so without further ado just a reminder before I sort of start speaking that uh, this presentation is protected by copyright and if anybody wishes to distribute it when they've received it, they do need written permission from World Stainless. So that's the, the first thing. And then the second other thing to note is I'll be speaking for about 40 to 45 minutes before we jump into questions. So to give you an idea of timing overall. Now in today's webinar, there are five main sections uh, of differing lengths before we have a summary to, to sort of wrap up the key themes. So I'll start with a short introduction to cover the global reinforcing bar market, then uh, a quite detailed examination of corrosion considerations for building an infrastructure, uh, a shortest section on life cycle thinking, which has been something I've talked about in webinars in the past, but particularly aligned to this theme. Uh, then we'll look at suitable stainless steels for reinforcement and then moving on to selective and effective use of stainless steels before summing up. So that's today's outline agenda. So I'd like to move on now to give a short overview of the global reinforcing bar market. But the, the right place to start is by considering the total amount of steel products used in building an infrastructure on an, an annual basis. And it's around half the total globally produced steel products and 900 million tons is around half of total annual steel production currently and a little over a third of that at 36 percent is actually reinforcing bar products so it, in tonnage terms it's a significant tonnage at 325 million tons per annum and this figure grows it was valued in 2022 at uh, over 220 billion us dollars so it's a significant valuable market but when you consider the stainless steel usage in this application area it's less than one percent so a very small amount of the total reinforcing bar used is, is stainless steels however there have been a number of new major projects that have specified stainless steel reinforcement and a couple of very sizable examples is the Champlon bridge in canada and the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Causeway in China. And whilst these are very much showcase uh, installations, stainless steels are really not considered on a routine basis. And I'll try and sort of examine why some of that occurs and how we might want to consider changing that and why changing it is important. So let's now start to look at the global reinforcing bar market over the next decade and there's a lot of positive opportunity here because the forecast compound average growth rate over the next 10 years is almost at 
five percent it's just a shy under and it's based on seven key drivers one is continued mass urbanization currently we have about 55 percent of the global population living in towns and cities and by the time we get to 2050 that is expected to reach almost 70 percent of the global population so a huge opportunity there in the building and infrastructure environment but also continued strong economic growth particularly in asia i know there have been difficulties in in recent years starting with the the pandemic but hopefully things are are recovering despite the the tricky economic pressures we we sit in today but also as mass urbanization continues governments will need to invest in infrastructure and that presents opportunities in the towns and cities but also on coastlines where we need to protect ourselves so against the the oncoming onslaught of climate change and extreme weather events equally technological advances both in, in materials and how we sort of undertake our lives will demand more sort of urban buildings uh, there's a growing emphasis on the seismic safety of structures and installations, which is equally important. And also the construction industry is migrating towards sustainable construction practices, which is not just about how things are built, but what materials things are made from. And equally, if we continue on the mass urbanization track, then we need to um, be able to provide more energy into our towns and cities and improved faster slicker public transport systems so you can see how all these things pretty much link together so having set the scene with the sort of market potential i'd now like to move on to sort of one of the more detailed sections looking at corrosion considerations for building an infrastructure so to open this we have to sort of recognize that most reinforcement for concrete structures is carbon steel reinforcement as i touched on earlier and carbon steel reinforcement is naturally protected from corrosion by a passive layer which results from the initial alkalinity of the concrete in which it sits so that's an important start point we have a composite structure that is good however that protection can be destroyed when the concrete becomes carbonated and therefore acidic due to the diffusion of carbon dioxide through the concrete pores and once you change the ph of the concrete from an alkaline ph to an acidic ph corrosion of the reinforcing bars can occur and it primarily results from chloride iron attack. And that's the major cause of corrosion in reinforced concrete structures. So let's try and sort of understand how this happens. So where do the chloride ions come from? Well, really they, they come from sort of a number of sources. One is prolonged use of de-icing salts. So in regions of the world above the snow line, so to speak, also and logically they come from seawater whether it's splashing of seawater through through waves and high winds or direct immersion of, of structures into seawater but also and this is a, a sort of improving trend chlorides in the concrete mix chlorides have often been used as part of the sort of total mix of input products and they sort of have a detrimental effect too but of course as i said earlier without carbon dioxide and particularly moisture that goes with that the chlorides don't actually attack the reinforcing bar so where do the where does the moisture and co2 come from it comes from pollution in the area which includes transport industrial exhaust emissions and the moisture obviously comes from things like rain river water seawater effluent discharges anything that the concrete is exposed to that is fundamentally wet and when you have those two things diffusing through the concrete, what you effectively create is carbonic acid. And that turns the alkaline uh, nature of concrete into acidic. But what we must never ignore is the presence of sulfates, because if concrete structures get exposed to sulfates, that actually degrades the concrete quickly. 
and the concrete then cracks and small pieces fall off and essentially disintegrates as the sulfates diffuse through the concrete. So sulfates add a complication that speeds up the overall corrosion process. So let's look at how that unfolds with a, with a little sort of diagrammatic sequence now. So if we start, and the blue box here represents nice pristine concrete in its alkaline form with a piece of carbon steel rebar sitting at a level subsurface. And on the outside of the concrete, we have CO2 in the atmosphere, we have chloride ions coming from whatever source they do, and we have water. And let's not forget, as I mentioned, sulfates. If sulfates are present, this process that I'm going to describe will only speed up. So we can say in the start position, we have robust reinforced concrete. There is no detrimental problem to the reinforcing bar or the concrete itself. However, with this atmosphere on the outside, as time elapses, the carbon dioxide diffuses into the concrete, the water too diffuses through the pores in the concrete, and that progressively carbonates the concrete. And the chloride ions start to diffuse in too, but at the moment they're doing nothing worrying. So at this stage too, we have carbonated reinforced concrete, but around the rebar in this diagrammatic piece, the concrete is still alkaline, so everything is okay. If we roll forward time again, the carbonation of concrete progresses. So now it's progressed as far as the surface of the rebar. The chloride diffusion continues to progress and hits the rebar. And now we have a worrying position because what we now have is non-passive reinforcement. The passive film that existed on the rebar in its alkaline state has been destroyed. And now the rebar can corrode. So in the final picture of this sequence, the chloride ions cause what's known as pitting corrosion on the rebar. The rebar rusts. Rust gives a volume expansion. So the rebar in size grows bigger overall, the substrate metal and the rust together. And the concrete cracks. So in this stage of events of degradation of concrete we have corroded reinforcement and we have spalled concrete and once you have cracks in the concrete pieces fall off and the chloride ions can attack much faster so this is the sequence of events and it's quite worrying when you look at it in this sort of context now to understand how to protect we have to understand the operating environment and there are normally for concrete cover this is cover above the rebar there are five considerations for operating environment but for the use of stainless steel we only have to consider the two worst in the most cases so the very severe and the most severe environments and this is where the concrete services are exposed to chloride containing things whether that be seawater spray or de-icing salts or sort of chlorides that are in, in the air for other reasons or, or come from seawater immersion. But equally, we have to recognize that we need CO2 diffusion to occur. So the concrete surfaces have to be exposed to other detrimental things, CO2 and sulfates, whilst they are wet. So if they're below the waterline or in the splash zone, of course, they're wet quite frequently. If they are covered with de-icing salts, they'll be wet fairly frequently too. So these are the areas where we have to get more worried about what's going to happen to our reinforcing materials. And if we put that in the context of the key rules associated with um, concrete cover over reinforcement and look at the two most severe categories, very severe and most severe, then what you can see here is the concrete cover needed varies somewhat with the type of the grade of concrete uh, as the grade gets more sort of refined and protective the concrete cover can be lessened but in the most severe cases you still can't go less than 50 millimeters of concrete cover before your rebar 
is in the uh, in the submerged in the concrete. So this gives some important guidance. Now, while we have seen most people who have seen examples like the one on the image here, it is only the major catastrophes that become headline news. So things like this structure we see here, where concrete has clearly spalled and fallen away and exposed the rebar even more often don't make the news but big things like the Morandi bridge in Italy which was major news when it collapsed in 2018 they make the news but for every one of those there's hundreds of other things looking like the photograph so the scale of the problem is immense so let's now just reflect on that by looking at the Champlain bridge which I mentioned in my introduction and this is the new Champlain bridge in Canada uh, and this was built to replace the original bridge, which was opened in 1962. And this bridge lasted for just 57 years. And during its 57 years of life, the total maintenance costs were 450 million US dollars. So an average of 8 million US dollars per year. That's a huge amount of money to spend on a problem that can be avoided. And in this environment, it had both the heavy use of de-icing salts being in Canada above the snow line in a marine environment. So that's why the original bridge was beset with problems. And in the new bridge, they specified 15,000 tons of stainless steel reinforcement in a duplex stainless steel. And I'll talk about duplex stainless steel in a little while in this presentation. So this is a great example of how smart resilient materials thinking can change an outcome particularly from a maintenance perspective dramatically so let's move on now to think about how chlorides diffuse through concrete and as i said early on corrosion of steel reinforcement induced by chlorides is a major problem it's the biggest single cause of um, corrosion in reinforcement in the world and it's particularly a problem in marine environments and where de-icing salts are used however chloride diffusion is not straightforward so the chlorides diffuse in what's known as the pore solution of the concrete so within the pores in the concrete you get water dragged into there the water sort of moves through the pores and the chlorides diffuse through that uh, wet pore solution however Concrete itself has some capacity to bind or stop chlorides diffusing. And there are two types of binding, both physical binding, which is completely reversible, and chemical binding, which is irreversible. And certain products that can be added to concrete can slow the diffusion rate down by increasing the amount of binding. But we should note that chlorides are not ever bound 100 percent so some will still diffuse it's only the free chlorides that will cause corrosion of the reinforcement bound chlorides won't but we have to remember that physically bound chlorides can become free chlorides so binding for those uh, chlorides that are trapped in the physical structure ultimately become free but it's also worth reflecting on the effect of uh, chlorides and seawater salinity. And this chart, this global chart, is a very interesting way to consider this. Now, it's a tricky chart to read because the grey areas on this are the land masses. So you can see to the left that we have Australia, we have Asia, we have Russia. And where it goes off the graph, that's moving towards Europe and uh, and africa then just to the right of center we have the americas and greenland right at the top and then in the right hand piece we have europe and uh, africa so all the very highly colored sections are reflect the uh, salinity of the seawater and where you've got orange reds and pinks they are the really high sort of chloride rich areas and the pattern is perhaps not what you would expect. So the Atlantic Ocean is very salty, pretty much everywhere, whereas the Pacific Ocean has uh, streams of high salinity 
and there are other areas where you look around the Indian Ocean, for example, where the saline content is really high. And what's interesting to note in this is when you get to chloride concentration levels above 1.8%, then the diffusion of chlorides in concrete speeds up and that becomes a worry and it goes quite deep into the concrete in relatively short periods of time. So if we hold that notion for a moment, I'm going to try and explain on the next chart what is going on. So we've got a chart here showing total chloride concentration and on the y-axis and then on the x-axis the depth of chloride diffusion so the starting point of zero is the surface of a concrete structure and there are two different uh, data sets to consider so i'll start by describing the red line and the green line which represent a concentration of 1.5 percent chloride at the surface of the concrete and there are two scenarios here. The red line is a three month exposure. The green line is a 12 month exposure. And what you can see with the lines is how deep the chlorides diffuse over that time period. So within three months, you, the chlorides have reached a depth of 25 to 30 millimeters. And within 12 months, you're looking at 35 to 40 millimeters. So the chlorides continue to diffuse over time. Now, if you raise the chloride concentration from 1.5% to 2%, and these are reflected uh, by the blue and the yellow lines, after three months, the blue line tracking, chlorides have now diffused to 40 to 45 millimeters. So quite a significant jump by increasing the chloride concentration by 0.5%. And over 12 months, the chloride diffusion goes even further, approaching 60 to 65 millimetres. And of course, the longer time elapses, the more the chlorides diffuse. But when we're talking about um, reinforcing bar material that is somewhere between 40 and 50 millimetres below the surface of the concrete, you can see how quickly the chlorides reach that reinforcing bar. But as I said at the start, chloride diffusion needs carbonation to occur before initiation of corrosion of the carbon steel reinforcement will occur. So you need the two things side by side. But now we've got a marker for how quick chlorides diffuse through concrete. So let's try and sum up the sort of considerations here. There is no doubt, and it's well documented, that chloride corrosion of structural steel reinforcement is a major problem. It's around 50% of all the sort of corrosion problems in reinforced concrete. It occurs mainly in marine environments and where de-icing salts are, are used on a regular basis, but there are a number of features that create the right conditions. You need concrete carbonation. So you need that CO2 diffusion with moisture to change the concrete from being an alkalinic structure to, to acidic. Uh, you need water diffusion uh, as well. You need the chloride ions to diffuse through those poor diffusions, where poor solutions rather, where the water sits. We know that binding of chlorides in the concrete will slow down diffusion, but also the presence of sulfate ions will degrade the concrete, making chloride diffusion both easier and faster and high chloride content in seawater particularly will increase the penetration distance in the same amount of time so it's not just about chlorides being present it's the amount of chlorides the concentration as well that increases the penetration distance so having sort of set the scene i'd now like to move on and consider life cycle thinking because i think when you start to look at the degradation of structures which are a little more long term than some other degradation problems life cycle thinking becomes a very important tool for sort of putting everything together in your in your head but i'd like to start with a quote by uh, an american folk singer who is also a social activist pete seeger and he said if something can't be reduced reused repaired, rebuilt, refurbished, refinished, resold, recycled or composted, 
then it should be restricted, redesigned or removed from production. And I guess we can all think of examples in our lives today where we are selecting to use things, make things, build things with materials that don't satisfy those criteria at the top. So it's an interesting way to sort of open up this debate about life cycle thinking. So let's start with a few sort of uh, thought provoking considerations. So first and foremost, the annual global emissions to replace corroded steel products are 21%, so a little over a fifth of the total annual steel production emissions. So a fifth of the time or just over when we make steel, that's to replace steel that's corroded. So that could be avoided with a smart use of the appropriate materials. And why does that happen? And I would say that's down to three things, because the nature of corrosion in the operating environment is not properly understood. The types of corrosion that are likely to occur are not understood, and there are many possible types of corrosion, but I will focus on one particular type during this webinar, which is aligned to chlorides. And then there's also a misguided belief about the durability of both traditional materials and coatings. And coatings have been around for ages, but ultimately all coatings fail, which is why stainless steels become interesting because they have a bonded coating that is there caused by the alloy content of the stainless steel itself. And it's tightly adhering to its surface and self-repairing. So let's start by sort of thinking about the the built environment and life cycle thinking and what drives how we behave today and the approaches we adopt. And I think really simply it comes down to a couple of considerations. Are we aligned or wedded to what I call the install and repair approach to building and making things? Or do we align to what's known as the fit and forget approach? You don't have to worry so much about repairs and maintenance. And at a time when we should be considering the effects of climate change, is it really affecting our choice of materials? I believe it should be, but I believe we're driven by other forces that don't make that as effective as it really should be. So in order to put that into context, let's compare these two thinking styles. So in traditional thinking, we design with traditional materials as we have used for many years, many decades. But in life cycle thinking, we would design to prevent waste. However, that waste would come about, whether it's waste in creation of an asset or whether it's preventing waste due to degradation of an asset. Equally, in traditional thinking, we focus on upfront costs, the cost of building and installing something and the emissions associated with that and nothing beyond that point. Where in life cycle thinking, we should look at the whole of life costs and the emissions that come with that. And as you maintain things, you create more emissions. In traditional thinking, we don't think about deeply enough materials degradation. So the knowledge is not there. So it's not necessarily anybody's fault, it's a lack of education. Whereas in life cycle thinking, the people are embedded with materials performance knowledge. So we've elevated the educational level. And in traditional thinking, we expect maintenance to occur. It is the normal steady state of what happens. Whereas in life cycle thinking, we start with the premise that maintenance can absolutely be either avoided or minimized. So if we haven't made that leap of faith to life cycle thinking in the present environment where we face with climate change, extreme weather events, all the difficulties we see every single day on our televisions, we need to do it and we need to do it now. And to try and put that in context, it's helpful to look at what's known as the waste hierarchy. So do we think about waste routinely when we are sort of designing or building things? So first and foremost, do we choose the right materials, the resilient materials to prevent waste? And a very simple, sim, single, if I can get my words out, apologies for that, subset of that 
is avoiding things like single use packaging and single use products. It's a crazy environment we live in where the notion of using things once and throwing it away uh, is becoming a, an acceptable norm, particularly in our personal lives. But we should also think about how to reuse and repair materials and products at their end of life. Do they just have to be dumped end of life? And if we choose resilient materials, you overcome that. The third consideration is about recycling materials. And note recycling is third in this list. It's not top of the list. So we should try and sort of prevent things going wrong so that we still recycle if we have to, but we do it later, a later stage in the process. And recycling is still good. Then there's this notion of recovering energy from materials. If we can recycle materials, we don't have to extract virgin materials and process them from the earth. So we don't incur the energy there. We can use our available energy more efficient, efficiently. And then only lastly should we consider disposing of materials and products to landfill, because that's really a bad thing to do. And we see the evidence of that again on a fairly regular basis. So I'd now like to illustrate life cycle thinking based on one of what was known as the Midland Link viaducts in the UK. And there were several of these viaducts built in a sort of uh, extensive road complex. And what I'd like to do is use a chart here that has cost shown in millions of euros on the Y axis and time in years on the X axis on the bottom. I'm only going to look at 20 years because the devastating effect of the wrong type of thinking is clear in just 20 years using this example. So what we're going to start with the little dot that's appearing is the viaduct that was built fully using carbon steel reinforcement cost about 28 million euros. And this was built in the 70s. So 28 million euros back then was a lot of, lot of cash, a lot of money. Had the designers, <coughs> oh, excuse me, thought to use a small amount of stainless steel reinforcement, 10% of a molybdenum bearing stainless steel known as 316L, it would have cost a little bit more, about 32 million euros. So at the time, that's a sizable difference. So the cost difference was about 11%. Now let's start to put the timelines on of cost. So for the first few years, not much happened. There was not much degradation. There was a little bit of cost associated with bridge inspections, but had you used 316 L stainless or a selective use of that, the costs would have moved in broadly the same direction. But then as we got into year five and beyond, we see the change and the maintenance needs began after just four years. So now you can see very quickly, we're not many years into the life of this structure and already the choice of 100% car carbon steel reinforcement is starting to prove costly. And as time moves on, the costs accelerate, the maintenance needs continue. And if a small amount of stainless steel reinforcement had been put in those subsurface layers, minimal maintenance would have been needed. And so over time, the maintenance costs for the less resilient materials just accelerate. And the ending position after 20 years is a 2.5 times cost difference for not thinking about materials resilience and the corrosion problems that occur. And this example, it's very simple, it's very easy to understand, but has occurred in many parts of the world. The same sorts of material choices based on lack of knowledge result in huge costs. So if we were spending our own money, would we do the same thing as was originally done, the brown line, or would we choose the green option here? Just a question to have in your own minds. So let's summarize life cycle thinking. I would say it's not hard to understand and follow. It's highly informative if you think of things from a different perspective. It is a system that's designed for producing less waste by a long, long way. If you don't have to repair and replace things, you're, you've got a much more efficient system. And often when you repair, repair and replace things, you get disruptions. And if it's a road or other transport system, the disruptions are big. It's a logical mechanism for how to consider resilient materials. And when you understand corrosion, you understand what materials you need. 
and it is a clear approach that delivers cost and emission reductions. And when you think about a big structure like a building or a bridge, 60 to 70 percent of the life cycle emissions occur in the operational phase, not in the creation phase because of repairs. So if you can get rid of repairs, you can reduce emissions massively. So let's move on now to section four of this and look at suitable stainless steels for reinforcement because it's not straightforward. First thing to say is today we have more than 200 different stainless steels available in our portfolio of products, each one designed for a different application and different environment. However, for many people around the world, they have a poor knowledge of what stainless steels exist. Most people know about two grades only, 304 and 316, and they don't know the plethora of grades that exist beyond that. But in terms of considering stainless steels, one helpful approach is to pitch the notion of the 0.2% yield strength of materials alongside what is known as the PREN, the pitting resistance equivalent number. And this is a guidance for the resistance of pitting corrosion of different materials because pitting corrosion occurs in the presence of chloride ions, which is fundamentally what we're talking about today. So let's look at a chart that explains this. So on the Y axis here, we have the yield strength in megapascals ranging up to 600 megapascals, and we have the pitting resistance equivalent number on the X axis along the bottom from zero to 50. And you can see on the right hand side in the text, the pitting resistance equivalent number comes from a formula derived by the amount of chromium in the steel, the amount of molybdenum in the steel with a 3.3 times multiplication factor there, and the nitrogen in the steel with a 16 times multiplication factor. So if we look to the left hand side of the chart, we have a classic structural steel, S355, which has a reasonable strength, 355 megapascals, not 0.2% yield strength, but a lousy pitting resistance equivalent number of six. So it's not going to do very well. To the right of that, you have some common stainless steels that have low strength and improved pissing resistance equivalent numbers, but they are to the left hand side, left hand side, sorry, of the seawater splash threshold. So if you're in an area where you get regular seawater splashing, these grades don't offer sufficient corrosion resistance. Then we move into a zone to the right of the seawater splash threshold, and you have an aluminium alloy in there that would survive quite well, but has relatively poor yield strength. The 316L stainless grade is in there because it contains molybdenum. And then above that, you have the high strength duplex stainless steels that all contain molybdenum. And this is where the game changers sit. Once you think about duplex stainless steels, you have high strength grades that give good corrosion resistance or good to excellent corrosion resistance. And the last two grades on this chart, the 2205 duplex and the 2507 duplex, are both suitable for seawater immersion environments. So this chart gives a really good and easy description when you're thinking about the types of corrosion induced by chlorides. So using this comparative of these two attributes gives you really solid guidance. It gives you the opportunity to pick the most appropriate seal grade for the operating environment, remembering define the environment carefully and understand the chloride content in that environment. But by choosing high strength steel grades, particularly in the stainless steel duplex family, you can reduce the amount of total concrete in the structure. You can exploit those high yield strengths. And it's always worth saying, if S355 structural steel is my traditional piece of thinking, where is the stainless steel grade being considered in relation to that? Now, as we get to the end of this section, stainless steels can significantly improve structural longevity as long as you choose the right grade. And I talked early on about stainless steels having a passive layer, and this is important to understand. That passive layer comes about by the steel having at least 10.5% chromium present. 
It's fundamentally a chromium oxide layer. It's tightly bonded to the substrate alloy. It's two to three nanometers thick. It doesn't flake off like rust does. If it's damaged, it repairs itself in the presence of oxygen. It can be in air, it can be in water. It will still self-repair. But that passive layer must be capable of protecting the stainless steel against the expected corrosion types. And I touched on pitting corrosion. This is important because chlorides deliver pitting corrosion and even the passive layer without the right amount of alloying can break down so molybdenum is really important as an alloying element to protect against pitting corrosion because it reinforces that passive layer it's like having another suit of armor on your stainless steel so it's important that molybdenum bearing stainless steels are used in chloride environments so let's move on and now look at the selective and effective use of stainless steel reinforcement as we get to the sort of latter stages. So most people will say, hey, thinking about stainless is tricky. These are expensive materials. The upfront costs are high, which is why people don't choose them. But it's not necessary to do 100% replacement of your structural steel reinforcement with stainless steels. You only need something of the order of 10%. And it's about protecting that first subsurface layer of reinforcing bar. Because if you protect that, you stop the concrete from spalling and you slow down the deterioration almost to nothing of the reinforced concrete. And when you choose duplex stainless steels, because they are a high strength option, you can reduce, as I said, the amount of concrete by up to 25%, 20 to 25% less concrete is really doable with these choices of material in this selective way. And we'll just illustrate that with a case from Scotland, the Queen's Ferry Crossing, which was opened in 2017. And this was a brand new bridge costing 1.65 billion euros over the River Forth in Scotland. It's a marine environment, because the River Forth at this point is very close to the sea, but also de-icing salts are used in the winter months. So it falls in one of those top two environment categories. The design requirement was better than 120 years with minimal maintenance. And the old bridge, which was built and opened in 1964, had just got ongoing problems for its life. The deck joints um, in the structure allowed the progressive rebar corrosion and structural fatigue occurred, corrosion in the steel cables, because stainless wasn't used in this selective manner. And just as a point of interest, it was the same English Queen, the late Queen Elizabeth II, who actually opened both bridges, the old bridge and the new bridge, on the same date, just 53 years apart. So what was interesting about this project? Well, firstly, there's a lot of concrete, 150,000 tonnes of concrete. There were 23 miles of supporting cables for the bridge. And in the deck area, there was 32,000 tonnes of steel reinforcement. But 11% of that was 2304 duplex stainless, which was all anchored and coupled with 2.4 tons of 2205 duplex stainless. So these are good quality duplex stainless steels made to resist pitting corrosion. And furthermore, another molybdenum bearing grade, 316L, was used for the cable assemblies. So almost eight and a half thousand tons. So there was a really smart use of stainless in this structure, but following the principles of selective new use, not total use. Now let's try and explain what I mean if people have not got this quite yet for selective use of stainless steel. This is a very simple schematic. So we've got the gray box is an image of a concrete slab with reinforcing bars running through it in and out of the picture. The green circles are the stainless steel reinforcement and the black circles are the carbon steel reinforcement. And as I said earlier on, it's about the positioning of corrosion resistant materials in that first subsurface layer, because that's where your chlorides are going to hit first. That's where the CO2 will diffuse to relatively quickly. And if you stop problems at that point, the integrity of the whole structure is maintained. So this is the really important consideration. And I know this is a very simple view. A true concrete slab would be much bigger, but at least it gives you 
the sort of an example of the proposition. So to sum up now, because we're just about out of time, we know from all the sort of data we have, the outlook for the building and infrastructure sector remains really positive, and that's good. It helps economic development in many parts of the world. But because we've got these ongoing impacts of climate change and extreme weather events, we need our structures to be resilient, to safeguard our people and safeguard the economies which they are part of. Chloride induced corrosion of steel reinforcement is a major problem. It's the biggest single problem for, for concrete structures. And many global structures already show visible signs of this. But what's equally worrying is the initial invisibility of this corrosion mechanism is also very worrying because by the time you see it, these things remain hidden for some time. You've got a major job to put things right. So avoiding it is really helpful. And when you think about repairing corroded reinforcement, it's not easy. You've got to cut away all the areas of the concrete where the chlorides and the CO2 is diffused to. And it's well known and understood that 60% of repairs fail, concrete reinforcement repairs, fail within 10 years of the repair. So the, the sort of track history is not good. The additional cost of selective use of stainless steels is only around 10% more. And it avoids all those oncoming going costs that come with significant maintenance, which you've seen from the Midlands Link example escalate very quickly in quite a short time span. And repairs significantly contribute to global emissions. We talk about reducing production emissions, but there's a bigger price to be had if we can reduce emissions derived in that operational phase. So we need to change our traditional thinking and shift to life cycle thinking. And the use of resilient materials in this smart way, not the total use, this smart selective use is the mechanism to support that. So I hope that made sense. That's the sort of end of the presentation. I'd like to say to everybody that's joined online, thank you very much for your attention. It is appreciated. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them now. We have questions, Tim. OK, let's, uh, let's fire away. First one coming. Which are the countries already start, started the use of stainless steel rebar majorly and what are the current or upcoming projects? And also indicate uh, country-wise which grade of rebar they use, if you know. Okay, so what we know already is that countries uh, around the Asia-Pacific region, including Australia, and New Zealand have been adopting stainless on a progressive basis for some time. And we have quite a long list of, of examples, including the, uh, the one that's on screen now. Um, also in, in Canada, in the Americas, and to a lesser extent, but uh, the, uh, the, the situation is developing in Europe. Um, the adoption of stainless is, is now becoming more common. However, what is the sort of worry is it tends to be sort of big projects where you have the understanding that stainless delivers huge benefits, um, where the selection of stainless gets made. Some of the smaller projects get completely overlooked. And I think that's, that's one of the sort of key worries if you look in the USA, for example, at the moment, where they do have a, a regime for bridge inspection, some 15%, 1-5% of bridges are structurally deficient. And uh, in many cases, repairs would be hugely costly. So replacement is the better option. And people are starting to wake up to that. But in other parts of the world, there are no major deficiencies in, in structures, but they're not being addressed yet. Um, there's also an interesting consideration. When you look around the Middle East, there is also some improved knowledge in, in big structures. There are some causeways there that have been built using a significant proportion of stainless. But you've also got another dilemma there, and you get degradation of structures that are actually on land caused by the wick effect. So chlorides from the marine section actually migrate through the, the sandy structure 
and then migrate or diffuse up through the concrete. So whilst we focused on marine environments primarily and heavy use of de-icing salts, there are other slightly inland areas that uh, also get the sort of uh, unpleasant effects of chloride diffusion. In terms of future projects, it's not a list that is naturally made available to us. We tend to find about, out about projects as they come on stream um, because our representation is to the stainless steel producers, not necessarily the construction community. So we're a bit out of the loop there. So I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer that part of the question. Um, and uh, how about uh, which are the majorly consumed grades? I think now, again, this is something that has evolved over time. The majorly consumed grades are now in the duplex family of grades. Uh, so they tend to be the 2304 duplex, which is EN 1.4362, which was used on the structure shown on the on the slide now, and 2205 duplex EN 1.4462. Uh, they tend to be the most highly consumed grades. Uh, uh, they are popular and, and sort of pretty much well available in many parts of the world. Um, of course, there are other grades. If you've got only, say, a splash environment, you could go to a leaner duplex grade, the uh, 1.4162, the 2101 lean duplex. And I would say it's very unusual to think about selecting 2507, the super duplex grade, um, unless it's a very extreme application. So it tends to be the, the grades in the middle of the duplex family range, the 2304 duplex and the 2205 duplex that are most commonly used and are most appropriate. Okay, and then th there's one question because you showed this slide where you have the joint use of stainless and carbon reinforcement. And would there be uh -oh. any, would it be necessary to have any special measures to avoid galvanic corrosion. Right, now this is a, a always an interesting area and I didn't sort of dwell on this particularly. There is no doubt that when you've got a corrosive media present and you couple uh, a carbon steel to a stainless steel, you will get galvanic corrosion of the less noble material, which is the carbon steel. However, there are there have been many pieces of work done by different research institutes, including the Concrete Society, that explain how you can couple these things safely in concrete to avoid galvanic corrosion. And I don't have all the data right in front of me now, but if the question has left their email address, which I hope they have, I can supply that information with all the guidance from the Concrete Society. So it can work, but you just have to be aware of the rules and the guidance. In India, 410L rebar are being used uh, by highways and railways projects um, 30 kilometers from the coastline. Could you throw a light on, on this grade and could cover thickness be reduced by using this grade? Okay, so 410 stainless is a, is a chromium stainless steel, so it will, like all stainless steels, it will have a passive layer. If you've not got chlorides present, then it will work effectively. Um, but if you have chlorides present for whatever reason, then it would be an unsuitable grade. Um, the guidance for concrete cover, um, I would never undermine because it's there for good reason. But um if you supplemented a proportion of that 410 for a duplex grade you could reduce the total amount of concrete in the structure not the cover the concrete cover level i would say is a golden rule that you should always stick by don't try to reduce the cover to that first layer but you can reduce the total concrete if you can exploit the high strength of other stainless steels so I hope that answers the question. Then another one um, regarding the welding of the traditional reinforcement bars 
we work with AWS D1.4. Is there a standard to weld stainless steel reinforcement bars? Well, I would advocate that when you're working with reinforcement bars, uh, bar couplers are the better way to go because um, welding does demand um, adherence, careful adherence to the welding standards that are around. But if you choose duplex stainless steels in the heat affected zone of the weld, you will create, if you do not fast cool it, a phase called sigma phase that forms in duplex grades on slow cooling and it's completely brittle. So it will destroy the integrity of your reinforcement, which is why I said use couplers. So couplers are always a better approach for reinforcement. Um, and that way you avoid welding. It's a little increase on the material cost, but then in your sort of uh, um, fabrication costs, they're massively reduced. So I think it's a fair trade off. And I was always advocate going that way. Thank you, Tim. Another uh, question uh, asking for a comparison. What would be the advantages or disadvantages of using stainless steel rebar over JFRP reinforcement? GFRP reinforcement. Is that fiber reinforced, some kind of fiber reinforced plastic? I'm I guessing. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, when you, when you get to fiber reinforced materials, they are in terms of their properties, excellent. You know, corrosion is not a problem. They're lightweight, they have high strength, but you can't recycle the things. They're a nightmare to recycle. And I think when we have to think about saving the planet, fiber reinforced products are not going to save the planet. They're just going to increase landfill in some future years. So they have some great attributes for sure. But when you put your sort of climate change head on, are they really the right choice? When 96% of end of life stainless steels are, are captured and recycled year in, year out and have been for many years, would you really choose a product that cannot be recycled? Interesting question. Um, we have a question here. Um about who's manufacturing stainless steel rebars in India. I think we can send the list um, afterwards. Um, we can, yes. It's one of those things I don't carry in my head. Um, but of course, we can provide a list. That's not a problem. Um, and I don't know whether we can provide um, some kind of indication what the consumption of rebars is and what the future growth might be. Well, we know that in 2022, 325 million tonnes of rebar was consumed across the, the planet. And the forecast growth is, is almost 4.5% year on year for the next 10 years. So that gives an indication. The, the real issue is very little of that is stainless today, apart from on the big, big projects. Uh, and if we're serious about saving the planet, we, we need to change a proportion of that uh, to, to avoid the problems uh, and it's great when you see examples like this causeway on, on screen where they've thought about this causeway existing for a long time with with no disruptions and that's why stainless is, is in there on a on a selective use basis uh, and that's the right way to go a, a question uh, about um the upcoming projects in India and Asia, but I think, like you said before, Tim, um, we don't know at the moment. No, no, it's not something we naturally carry. You know, for us, getting the knowledge and the education into people's heads who are actually involved in this work or meet people who are involved in this work is, is what we're about, because we're trying to look at sustainable solutions uh, but we're not responsible for developing those projects um any more any more joe no it's all about the future of stainless steel rebar and the consumption and growth um 
we can say on a global basis, but not for particular countries. Um, so I think that's no. about it. Yeah, yeah, and and just to sort of touch back on that that growth, uh, somebody asked early on, you know, how does it look in different regions of the world? And there are, of course, different uh, growth trends and different traditions in terms of choice of materials. Um, but what we have to recognise is that uh, most of what this presentation was about was dealing with chloride corrosion of concrete because that's the single biggest issue, and if you're nowhere near sort of chlorides in the operation of your installation whether it be a building a bridge then you don't have the same dilemmas to deal with but once you start to engage with chlorides not by choice but because they're there or they're needed to to melt snow or ice then you need a different set of considerations in your mindset um, so we're not trying to change rebar in every single installation. We're thinking about the biggest problem facing um, the use of reinforced concrete across the globe. Will the same magnitude of ductility be achieved in stainless steel rebars compared to carbon steel rebars? Now, it's a, it's a really good question. And generally with duplex grades, you've got a small concession on ductility. However, having said that, we're not talking of orders of magnitude difference. We're talking about very small differences. So the duplex grades that were illustrated in the, the chart for pitting resistance equivalent uh, and were used in the examples that I've shown are perfectly suitable uh, for those applications and, and sit nicely. What you've got to remember is that you're talking about a 10 or 11% use of stainless steel alongside uh, 90, broadly 90% carbon steel reinforcement. So the impact is, is very small indeed. As I said, there is a small concession on ductility, but not very much. So it's not significant in the, the overall scheme of things. Right. Moving on about this uh, ductility, um, mm. is it possible to have a stainless steel material of low strength comparable to carbon steel and high ductility to use in low rise building projects to lower the cost of the project? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a really uh, nice question. And of course, you can, you can look at the austenitic family of grades um which have really good ductility and formability um and they are well prized for that but the issue with those grades is they contain significant amounts of nickel which is quite expensive and the duplex family of grades don't so if you want to think about a lower strength uh, stainless grade of course that is truly possible uh, as long as it's the right grade for the environment but you will find the cost is driven by the cost of nickel rather than anything else and that may just change considerations i would argue that low nickel grades like the duplex family uh, are more effective and there are plenty of examples of where the lean duplex family of grades have been used in in structures too of course in this webinar we can't illustrate all those things but um if the questioner would like some examples of that sending across then i'm more than happy to do that okay uh, thank you next question are there any special considerations for the point at which carbon steel and stainless steel rebar is joined can this prove joe sorry i lost the last bit of what you were saying uh, can it be a weakness if so uh, the point where the carbon steel and the stainless steel is joined yeah well there's a whole set of rules from from the concrete society on the joining of stainless and carbon steels because uh, as i'm sure the questioner uh, is probably aware that you maybe have a risk of galvanic corrosion with dissimilar materials in contact however uh, if you're joining 
the materials in a, a, a well sort of structured concrete environment and you've got the passive layer on the carbon steel you've got a very very low risk and as i said this i've got some data from the um, concrete society on on exactly this question which i'd be happy to share with whoever's asked that question if that's helpful because i could speak for a, a long time on this and i don't think it's appropriate in the time we have left but i'd be happy to pass on that information that's no problem at all okay. um uh, then are there is there are there different rebar grades for organic and inorganic environments well the the rebar grades that are available are pretty much the ones i showed on the on the chart the tendency is now more to use duplex rebar grades because that offers significant environments but because stainless steels have this passive layer they're suitable for use in any environment even organic environments they don't pose any hazard threat and don't have any impact on the surrounding environment so the whole family of stainless steel grades are perfectly suitable for organic environments and you know they're fully used in in organic environments today rather extensively so i would argue it's not a concern whichever grade you choose okay i can see there are some hands raised uh, but it said uh, at the beginning of the webinar we prefer that you um put the question in in the question box thank you um and then the next question is why 41 zero l is not that much efficient than duplex steel as it has approximately a hundred percent chromium and for corrosion resistance um, i think chrome is more important than any other element i think it's a reflection yeah and it's a really it's a really good point to raise because it's it's a a very necessary uh, I, I think piece of understanding so first and foremost for people that don't know Chromium is what creates the passive layer in stainless steels, this protective layer, but you need a minimum of 10.5% chromium content in your stainless steel to deliver that passive layer. However, under certain corrosion conditions, the passive layer can be destroyed and pitting corrosion, which occurs in the presence of chlorides, will destroy a passive layer if you don't have the protection that molybdenum brings so this is why a grade like 410 which has reasonable corrosion resistance will not survive in a chloride bearing environment and that's why there's more than 200 different stainless steel grades around because you have to understand the causes of corrosion in the operating environment so whilst 410 may be a, a cheaper more affordable steel because it has primarily just chromium doesn't have nickel particularly um, it doesn't deliver the corrosion resistance you require for chloride corrosion and that's really important to understand that distinction um, and of course we're happy to help people if they're looking at different environments choose the right grade um, but you need a basic understanding of the different types of corrosion uh, and how to protect against them. So I hope that answers the question. Yes, because um, it, it has here a follow-up question saying that if you use 410L rebar instead of duplex, you reduce the project cost, but it doesn't help you because in the end it will corrode, will it not? If you've got chlorides present, absolutely. Yeah, a 410 grade is designed for certain applications and 410 rebar will work where you don't have any chlorides at all. I'm not going to argue against that, but I mean, when we sort of recognize that we're connecting uh, people with bridges and structures designed to last for a long, long time, um, then there has to be a different set of material considerations. So I'm not anti 410 rebar. If it's right for the environment, use it. But please remember that when you choose a duplex stainless steel, 
you can reduce the cost of other materials, i.e. concrete, by exploiting the much higher strength. So there's always a trade-off to be had. It's what I call horses for courses. You wouldn't choose a horse that only runs on a flat uh, racing track to jump hurdles. And it's the same sort of uh, issue with the choice of stainless steel. So th that's between like ferritic and duplex, but how does it compare to like austenitics? Well, I mean, austenitics have a lower yield strength compared to, to duplex. And whilst you have austenitics like 316L, 317L that will resist against chloride corrosion, you don't have the higher strengths unless you start to add nitrogen uh, to improve uh, the strength but then you create production difficulties. So th there's always a trade-off, as I said, you know, you can add things and work with uh, traditional grades that people are more familiar with, but you can also create uh, challenges. And I think the beauty of the duplex family of grades is that they are high strength, lower nickel and becoming more widely selected because of their attributes so austenitics yeah have been used and perform well but you know do they deliver the best attributes you want for these sorts of building and infrastructure applications i would say not always and that's a, a very important question so i think the advice i give back to the questioner here is it's better to understand the attributes of the materials you might want to consider before making a decision. Okay. Um, and then regarding the duplexes, are there like any problems with the microstructure of the duplex due to severe forming? Like for instance, stress, corrosion, cracking? Well, um, that's another important question. And I'm not sure who's asked that question, but I have a, a chart from a previous uh, webinar on understanding corrosion that deals specifically with stress corrosion cracking and shows where the key grades sit on that chart. If that was helpful for the questioner, again, I'd be happy to share that chart. Then you get an understanding of where different grades sit in response to stress corrosion cracking situations. Now, coming back to the formability, which was the early part of that question, duplexes are generally quite formable um the main problem uh, sort of uh, occurs if you sort of heat them up and don't quickly cool them or quench them and i've seen many examples of people trying to bend duplex components by heating them up and then just slowly air cooling them uh, and that risks the formation of a very brittle phase known as sigma phase in the microstructure and that is really not recommended ever so duplexes are cold formable but please if you're ever going to hot work a duplex it has to be quickly cooled afterwards and again we can provide more guidance on that if uh, if that's an issue for people so uh, it's just a word of warning about duplexes as i said all grades come with some great benefits but some uh sort of things to be aware of shall i say when you're working with them and understanding is the key Um, there's still a few questions, Tim. I don't know what you would like to do. Um, yeah, let's, let's take them. Let's take them. It's fine. If people are interested okay. and ask questions, it's um, good. Will stainless steel rebars be more effective in the foundation of the buildings in coastal areas? I would say duplex stainless steel rebars in the foundations would be very effective, providing it's the right grade and here comes the sort of uh, sort of consideration you you need to understand the uh, the uh, chloride content of the seawater for example you're putting the foundations in and then select the right grade of duplex that will work perfectly well in the immersive environment there so it's not a question of any duplex rebar will do it's the right grade for the right level of uh, chlorides in the environment. And that's important to note. Um, 
but also you need to look at how long you want the structure to last for, particularly in the foundations, because surface layer choice of duplex grades or subsurface layer, I should say more correctly, may not be sufficient. You may need to go a little uh, more expansive with your use of, of a duplex grade in the foundations. So it is important. And then an interesting question, can we apply coatings on it? You don't need to. I mean, the whole person, it's a very sensible question to ask, because if you're used to using coatings, then you think, uh, is this appropriate? Yeah, it's a, it's a sensible question to ask, I think. There is absolutely, absolutely no need to apply a coating to any stainless steel. If you choose the right stainless steel for the environment and the application, no coating is ever needed. I've heard people talk about, well, you know, perhaps I'd, this would work better if I'd coated it. It's only because the wrong grade of stainless steel was chosen for the environment. So I understand why those questions come about, and it's a very sensible question to ask to get clarity. So it's all about choosing the right grade for the environment, and then you don't ever need a coating. Okay, um, and then here um, is a, it says, ideally, what should be the brand number of duplex steel for better properties? Well, the, the Pren number is only about resistance to pitting corrosion. That's all it deals with. And pitting corrosion occurs in the presence of chloride, fluoride ions, things like that. So it's very specific to marine environments and the use of de-icing salts and other exposure to chlorides. It's not dealing with any other attribute or requirement from a material performance perspective. So it's really important to understand that PREN, the pitting resistance equivalent number, is only considering how to protect against a specific but very detrimental form of corrosion. um more about um chlorides and corrosion what is the mechanism for higher resistance to chloride induced corrosion by molybdenum grade stainless steel so what molybdenum effectively does is strengthen that passive layer in simple terms there's a lot of chemistry behind this which would be difficult to describe without a diagram um but molybdenum brings like an additional three or four suits of armor along with it. So that passive layer does not get broken down when the chlorides sort of hit the, the outer surface of that passive layer. Uh, and that's the real benefit the molybdenum brings. And the more molybdenum you add, the more strength, the more suits of armor you're, you're sort of putting on, so to speak. So it really is fundamentally about strengthening the passive layer to make sure that that specific corrosion mechanism cannot initiate. So that's the benefit of molybdenum. It's a wonderful alloying element for these tricky environments. Um, and then it seems to be the last question for now, unless there's more coming. Um, yeah. Is World Stainless promoting stainless steel rebars and the relevant technology in India? And is your organization involved in evolving standards to follow in the construction industry? Well, again, a, a good question. Um, World Stainless has a, a partnership arrangement with a number of other associations in including the Nickel Institute, the International Molybdenum Association and the International Chromium Development Association. And jointly, we drive the development of, of standards for stainless steels in different applications. So there are always projects ongoing. The focus does tend to be towards the specifications and standards that have the biggest global reach and they tend to be the american and european standards today uh, so that's just to put things in context and then other more sort of regional standards if i can use that expression 
tend to follow the sort of way the more globally used standards become set and developed. So that's the approach that we take, particularly because we have to think about the level of impact we can have with this work, because often it involves some kind of testing um, process, which is not uh, sort of short to do and, and not without cost. So we have to sort of use our money wisely in these development processes. I hope that answers the question. Yes, uh, and if I may say so, I think uh, the Indian Stainless Steel Development Association is also our member and they take yeah. information from us and you can contact them as well. Um, we can send you their contact details if you like. Yeah, that's a good um, point, Joe. Point to make. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, so you've yeah. spoken about all of these stainless steel rebars now, and can the same be said for mesh as it is for rebar, like rod from Australia? Yeah, I mean, uh, stainless mesh is, is widely uh, gaining use now for things like um, gabions on, on coastlines, these effectively mesh boxes full of, of rocks that uh, give land protection because they not only sort of diffuse the, the impact of, of tidal effects and big waves, um, but when these boxes are, these gabion boxes are made from an appropriate stainless steel, they, they don't corrode uh, and will last there a long time. So they're being used more in, in mesh. And there are other applications to protect cliffs where I've seen stainless mesh used and i think probably joe we have one or two examples of that in our portfolio of, of examples so again we can share information with the questioner if that's helpful um, oh there's an whenever when i was going to say this was the last question um and it, there's an answer to your answer it says great so um i think that might have been the end of it tim OK, but it's nice that somebody appreciated the answer as well. You know, you try to be as clear and thorough uh, as possible in these moments, uh, but you hope that the message is just what people are looking for, too. Yeah, there's loads of thanks in the thread here as well. Uh, and thanks. Thank you. Um, and questions um, if we can uh, share the presentation. Um, Which we so. will, of course. That's normal for us. And the presentation on this last slide for people that are still watching has the uh, the email link at the bottom if you require further information. We're always happy to help when it comes to stainless. And there's also some more information um, as well, if you can go the slide down, Tim, so that there's um, an appendix, the appendix. where yeah, uh, few, people can find more details. There's more. I'm not going to read this out, but we've got some concrete deterioration myths, and we've got a bit more about uh, concrete deterioration from uh, John Broomfield at NACE, who's uh, very well respected in this area. So uh, it's very helpful to uh, to sort of look at those few slides too. I think that was okay. it. Well, for all people that attended, thank you very much. I hope you found it useful, informative, uh, and I hope that thinking stainless, uh, even in the selective manner that this webinar was aligned to is, is helpful for future pieces of work. So uh, thank you, everybody. Take care, stay safe, and I hope you join one of our webinars in the future. Thank you and bye-bye.